And then he swallowed a sword and Jesus cried. Okay, Pastor John, I'll receive that. Thank you. Much has been made about Mark Driscoll being yanked off the stage at the Stronger Men's Conference, but I'm going to talk to you about what really happened, why it matters, and in the second half of this video, I'm going to be interviewing someone who has firsthand experience with Mark Driscoll, and we will see. I'll show you some video that will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Mark Driscoll is, is eager for publicity. This is a publicity stunt, and he is a liar. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well today. I want to thank you so much for joining me. So just a few days ago, Mark Driscoll was indeed yanked off the platform of the Stronger Men's Conference because before he spoke, there was a, a performer that got up and uh, did a sword swallowing act. And he took that, Mark Driscoll took that as uh, <laughs> this guy trying to seduce the men there, apparently with a Jezebel spirit, which is bizarre. And we're going to get into all of that. And I'm, I've enlisted the help of a friend of mine named Gabe Hughes. Gabe is a pastor in Casa Grande, Arizona, and he also has the YouTube channel, WWUTT, when we understand the text. And Gabe and I both did some research into this, and we're going to talk about what happened. We're going to play some clips from this conference, uh, why it is important. So that will be the first part of this video. And in the second part of this video, timestamp down below there in the description, I'm going to be interviewing Travis Allen. Travis Allen is the pastor of Grace Church in Greeley, Colorado, and he used to be an elder at Grace Community Church when the Strange Fire Conference happened back in 2013, and he had first-hand interactions with Mark Driscoll, and Mark Driscoll pulled another publicity stunt. This is all this is, pure publicity stunt. And uh, Mark Driscoll did the same thing 11 years ago now. And Travis Allen had firsthand interaction with Mark Driscoll. And we have footage from the scene. And it will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Mark Driscoll is an absolute liar. And he is manifestly both unqualified and disqualified from being in the pulpit. So we're going to talk about all of this. So first part of the video here is my interview with Gabe Hughes. Well, Gabe, brother, how are you? Doing great, Justin. Thanks for asking. It is a beautiful, sunny day here in southern Arizona. We're already getting up to 95 this week in April. So <laughs> it's looking to be a hot summer. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. They're, they're predicting a possibility of snow up here in Montana in a couple of days. So... <laughs> <laughs> No. That's not us. Yeah. That's 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 not Arizona. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, Gabe, thank you very much for coming on the program, brother. And uh you were about to text me last night when I called you about about this subject matter. So quite the uh quite the brouhaha has been uh brewing over this um uh, stronger men's conference. Yeah, uh, at, at which Mark Driscoll was a speaker. So tell us um Tell us a little bit about what is this conference? So the Stronger Men's Conference has been going on for uh, about seven years. I think it started back in 2017, at least from what I was able to find, at least, uh, you know, going back that far. And Mark Driscoll has been involved in this conference for at least that long. This mm -hmm. is a church in Southern Missouri. Do you have the name of the church? Uh, James River Church, I think is the name of it. James River Church. Yes. Yeah. So they're the ones that put this on, and it's it, it's almost like they try to outdo themselves every year. It gets bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. It's almost like a Super Bowl halftime show. They'll have yeah. about the, the most macho stuff that you can think of with tanks rolling through and piling over cars and monster trucks and pyrotechnics and rock music, and you know it just gets bigger and bigger. So they'll even have people that'll perform these elaborate stunts there will, of course, at least according to their claim, be a presentation of the gospel. I know that one of the things that they were claiming uh, at this most recent conference that has gathered all this attention is that, you know, several hundred men came forward and gave their lives to Christ. So they claim that it's an evangelical thing, 
Uh, of course, our experience with big evangelical churches that do stuff like this is it's often a very watered down gospel. Yeah. Now, I've yeah. known men that have attend, attended stuff like this, and they will tell me, yeah, I got saved there, but then they mature in their faith and recognize, boy, what a circus that was. And praise yeah. God that he was able to use something like that to draw me to himself. But overall, you're not going to get uh, any true gospel preaching, an understanding of sin, the wages of sin, which is death, the eternity of hell that will come upon every person who is uh, who does not turn from their sin to the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, oftentimes, it's a very watered down presentation. It, it's it's huge on pyrotechnics, but not so much on theology. Right. So this, uh, there was a fellow actually that had contacted me in the midst of this controversy and had said that uh, that he and his pastor have had a ministry in Southern Missouri where they have evangelized people out of. Uh, this particular church and the influence that that church has had over the area. So he said it, it's it's a pretty big deal and uh, very unfortunate to see how much influence they've had in their region. Yes, indeed. And James River Church, this is a, an enormous church. And so to give people an idea of the theological flavor of this church, this is a word of faith church, NAR. Uh, Bill Johnson has been a guest preacher at this church at least one i think more i think I'd, i'm safe to say more than once so yeah i knew um, at least one time yeah 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 and i think more than that so uh if you're having bill johnson of bethel church come in and fill your pulpit that speaks volumes about who you are and what you believe absolutely uh other teachers have included greg rochelle who is uh, yeah. of life church in oklahoma city uh, John Gray, who used to be one of Joel Osteen's pastors, and the right. man is a is a multi time adulterer. Yes. Um, in yes. addition to being a prosperity gospel preacher and word of faith, like you mentioned, I mean, they all claim that God speaks uh, specific messages to them, and so mm -hmm. what I am saying is from God, and you must listen to me. That's that kind of theology is throughout this men's conference as well. Yes, absolutely, and uh, and they this is also the. This is also the show me the toes church. Are you? Yeah, you told me that, and I I had totally forgotten about that. I did not realize that that was related to James River Church. So you're gonna have to you're gonna yeah. have to uh, <laughs> expose that one, I guess. Yeah. So so for those of you who are not aware, so James River Church, pastor by John Lindell. This is a, a a signs and wonder, word of faith, prosperity, gospel, health and wealth kind of a church. And uh, a year or so ago, it's been not long ago, but uh, John Lindell came out and he made this claim of a testimony of a woman named Chrissy Thompson, who says that uh, some years back, her husband, I, I'm assuming now a strange husband or whatever, shot her toes off. And she was in a service and her toes grew back. And there's video of her making this claim. And they said, uh, the, the, the claim is, is that, Everybody saw this. Her toes grew back. And Bill Johnson has repeated that story at his church, Bethel Church. So it's, but anyway, someone who is um, closely associated with James River Church and Chrissy Thompson uh, knows her, doesn't believe it. And uh, <laughs> put, made this website. It's, I'm looking at it right now, showmethetoes.com. <laughs> oh my goodness. Show, show me the toes. <laughs> dot com and that so he's, he's basically got an open challenge like sh show me the toes okay so if if this happened and there are many 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 witnesses of it of it it happening in real time surely living in the 21st century and you know in the 2020s everybody and their uncle's got a smartphone how is there no video of this i mean yeah i, I would right. i would I think that would, if I saw something like that, I think that'd be worthy enough to whip out my iPhone and take some quick video. But uh, yeah, so this is a that's a story. That's a story that has no soul. Oh, I see what you uh, did. There. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> All right, so this is a heretical, wackadoodle church. Um, yeah. Um, women pastors and the whole nine yards, all that stuff okay. that goes along with yeah. the charismatic movement. So that's what we're dealing with. All right. So on to the subject matter at hand, what brings us together today to paraphrase, paraphrase uh, the prince's bride. All right. So I'm going to play this and um, 
This is a clip of what happened at the men's conference. So for context, well, let's set up the context. At this men's conference, Gabe, there was a man by the name of Alex Magala, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Who got up and performed apparently a, at least a half hour before Mark Driscoll preached. So tell us who Alex Magala is. So he's uh, he's basically a stunt performer. Uh, he has been on Britain's Got Talent, and this was kind of how he gained notoriety, doing this particular stunt that he did at this men's conference. And after making it to like the quarterfinals in Britain's Got Talent, he went on to do America's Got Talent and China's Got Talent. So he's kind of done this circuit, uh, this, this circuit of the televised talent shows around the world mm -hmm. and has gained notoriety from this. Now, it is true that he used to be a former stripper. Uh, I was not able to find out if he still does that or if he's even repented of that. But what has been pulled into this story is that he did a strip show at this men's conference, which really was not what happened. And that's what Driscoll was calling out. Uh, Magala was just doing the stunt that he is known for doing. Of course, he did it shirtless. Uh, you know, he takes his performance jacket off. He's showing his uh, his ripped physique. Now, I feel like I should interrupt here just for a second because I've seen some people say that uh, this must have been some kind of a strip-oriented theme uh, because he took his shirt off. Well, that can't really be the reason because at this Stronger Men's Conference, they've, they've had uh, several other events in which men have been without their shirts. Here's one, of course, of two guys boxing without their shirts, as, as you know, typically boxers do. Here's another guy doing weightlifting without his shirt. And here's another guy doing whatever this is uh, without his shirt. Uh, I must say it's pretty, pretty impressive to balance. Uh, yeah, so if you ever want to see a guy balance a big uh, log beam on a on whatever that is on his chin on fire uh, without a shirt on there you go you can see it all at the stronger men's conference so just being without a shirt in and of itself cannot possibly have been the reason at least not a legitimate one and then ascends this pole i guess i should explain the stunt so he he swallows a sword and then he ascends this pole with the sword still in his mouth and then he rapidly descends the pole and everybody gasps because they they think he's lost his grip or something but no he's fully in control of everything that's happening and just inches from the ground he stops before the sword you know would <laughs> would hit the ground and oh. impale him if that would happen yeah uh, it's a pretty death-defying stunt but that's what it is it's a stunt it's like a circus performance and of course that's what this men's conference is too it's a it's a goat farm it's a big circus performance it's yeah. entertaining yeah. the goats it's not uh it's not preaching the gospel that's right that's right okay so I'm going to play this video clip. Someone with their smartphone recorded this. This is not like an official feed or anything. Just someone in the audience posted this. And uh, so let's watch. I, I chose. I found this clip and I chose this particular clip because whoever posted it had uh, put in, um, uh, what do you call it? Subtitle, not subtitles, not subtitle. Um, okay, so here we go. But let me do this. Um, I've been up since one o'clock in the morning. The reason I'm hoarse is I have been praying for you, and my heart is very burdened for you. Okay, Gabe, I want to pause it right there. He says, I've been up since one o'clock in the morning, and the reason my voice is hoarse is because I've been praying for you, and my heart is burdened for you. When I heard that, I thought, isn't there something in the Bible about not letting your right hand know what the left hand is doing? And, you know, yeah, when you pray, don't sound a trumpet don't about it. Don't sound the trumpet about it. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I've, I'm obviously, as a Christian, prayed a lot in my life. I've never prayed myself hoarse. That just sounds yeah. weird to me. And if is he staying in a hotel and he's yelling in his hotel room <laughs> that is making him go so hoarse? I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I think somebody would call the front desk and go. I think right. the man next door is possessed. If you're praying hard enough and loud enough that you've yelled yourself hoarse, yeah, I think is God hard of hearing. I just that <laughs> just doesn't make any sense. So any, right off the bat, this has a ring of like, I ain't believe in this, but here we go. Well, and by the way, before you before yeah. you continue, there's even some context before this part where Driscoll says that uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this in my next session. 
if they allow me to come back. That's so right. it's almost like he's ready for he knows he's going to say something that's going to probably get him booted. Uh, and it, it really does kind of have a, an air of of uh, he was he was planning this. You know, he was taking yes. an opportunity to do something here. Yep. Yep. I agree 100 percent. And we're going to see that here in just a minute, too. And I want to be very careful with this, and it's not what I want to say, but the Jezebel spirit has already been here. Okay, the Jezebel spirit has already been here. What is a Jezebel spirit? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, this this is something that he's been on about for at least a year, probably more than that. He preached a sermon at his church, which is not far from me, by the way. Um, I live in Casa Grande. That's true. His church is in Scottsdale, which is just a little more than half an hour from me. So uh, at his church, he did this series where he talked about a Jezebel spirit. And there's a sermon that you can look up where he goes through 29 signs of the Jezebel spirit. So he talks about how a man can have an Ahab spirit or a woman can have a Jezebel spirit. And to kind of define what that is, you have to listen to the whole sermon because he doesn't give a definition of it. It's uh, it's these different things. If a woman is doing this, then she has a Jezebel spirit. And to just get, yeah. kind of give you an example, if a man is an overbearing man, then he has an Ahab spirit. If a woman is an overbearing woman, then she has a Jezebel spirit. And I'm sure it goes on from there to like, if she's sexually promiscuous, then she has a Jezebel spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, uh, that that's kind of the implication that he's giving here with regard to the Jezebel spirit is already in the room. Now here he's talking to a bunch of men. So I'm, uh, so he doesn't talk about Jezebel or, or an Ahab spirit. He says Jezebel spirit, but yeah. this is yeah. all kind of like stirring up the, the niche thing that he's been preaching on for the last year or so. Right. Right. And this, this fits perfectly. You know, he's gotten wrapped up with the modern uh, demon slayers and uh, casting out demons and all this kind of stuff, binding Satan, all that. You know, and if you've got a, if you've got, if you're an alcoholic, if you're looking at porn, if you're, you know, got anger issues, you've got a demon. Yeah, right. Exactly. You've got a demon. You don't have a sin problem. You've got a demon. You just got to cast that demon out and then you'll be all better and, and you won't have those issues anymore. So this is a way of short-circuiting people's sanctification, uh, assuming they're even regenerate. Uh, the the Bible the Bible gives us instructions to repent, put to death the deeds of the body. If you if you're looking at porn, you don't have a the demon of pornography in you. You've got a sin issue, right? And you need to repent. That is, yeah, that's your flesh. You yeah. are. You have not put to death the sin that is in you. Uh, Colossians 3, verse 5, put to death what is earthly in you. And then the sins that Paul mentions includes sexual immorality. And against such things, the wrath of God is coming. So it doesn't say anything about cast that demon out of you so that you can live holy unto God. Put to death your fleshly desires that you may be holy unto Christ. That's not what you hear from this. You hear no. that you have a, a spirit of, of some kind that needs to be cast out or it's that it, you know it's the old uh the devil made me do it sort of yeah. thing flip wilson theology yeah the devil made me do it all right the jezebel spirit opened our event this is a rebuke and a correction of no one this is an observation before the word of god was open there was a platform it was a high place on it was Pole, an Asherah. Okay, he says there's an Asherah pole. What? What? What is an Asherah pole? So, if you uh, are familiar with the sins of Israel in uh, First and Second Kings, for example, they would worship the Asherah, who is the mother god, and they would uh, erect a pole that would be the uh, symbol of the Asherah. It's kind of like Baal's wife. And uh, and so that's what he's claiming this was. So this stunt that this guy performed, climbing this pole and rapidly descending the pole, is right. is an altar to Asherah. That's his claim. Right. Whereas that you know th this is typical of the charismatic tendency to spiritualize everything they see. You know, if you see something a little bit unusual, um, 
whatever it is, it's, it's God somehow trying to get a message to you or something like that. It's, you know, I'm, I am no apologist for the, for the gimmickry that is rampant at this conference. I mean, that's all it is, is a bunch of gimmicks and, you know, um, pyrotechnics and a light show and all that kind of stuff, but come on. I mean, this guy's a sword swallower. It's what he does. This is not an Asherah pole. I mean, good yeah. grief, right? Yeah. And, and like I said, it turns out that this man does have a past as a stripper and has not just done this in front of women. He's done it in front of men. So he's a homosexual. What I don't know, because I really did not do a deep dive into the guy, but uh, what I am not sure of is if he's repented of that. Like, does the yeah. man now claim yeah. to be a Christian? And so that's why he was brought in to this Christian men's conference, because he has a testimony of I used to be in all this sexually debaucherous stuff, and now I've repented of that, and I've come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That would be interesting to know. If that's not the case, then the story here is not that they had a stripper performing a stripper performance, because that's not what happened. The story would be that they had an an outspoken, open homosexual entertaining these men. That's right. And that's that right. would be that would be a problem that needs to be called out. That would be that would be the issue, right? And. Uh, you went. You said you went to his website. You look, went to Alex Magala's website. Yeah, and I did not click on any links or pages in there because if he is a stripper, I just don't want to see it. So, <laughs> but it it did Can't have like either. the it did have like the list of stuff on the front of the page that was you know all the different talent shows that he's done and won and right. stuff like that. But there wasn't anything on the front page that that uh, presented him as a Christian performer. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if that's part of his, uh, uh, of his shtick or not. Right. And I went to his, um, well, I didn't go to his website. I haven't even seen that yet, but I did find a video of him on Twitter that he posted. And I think it was about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And it was, uh, something like the hardest season of my life. And I thought, okay, maybe is this, is this some kind of a, you know, testimony of conversion or whatever. And so I watched it and all he's talking about is how he, he did this, this same thing, you know, climbing the pole, um, and he and he ripped his ripped his bicep, oh, and uh, yeah, and wasn't sure he would be able to perform anymore because he injured himself, ripped his bicep. He had an, even had the video of him when it happened, but um, yeah, as best I can tell, this guy's not a Christian. If he is, I, we haven't seen any evidence of it. But the same thing that's used in the strip club for women who have the Jezebel spirit to seduce men. Okay, he just said a Jezebel spirit to seduce men, All right? <laughs> I mean, that really is a claim of like uh, we've right. we've got someone something homosexual going on here. That's what yeah, his, yeah, what his right. statement is. Yeah. So, so that's what he's suggesting. There's something homosexual going on here. In front of that was a man who ripped his shirt off like a woman does in front of a pole at a strip club. That man then ascended. See, our God is not arrogant. He doesn't ascend. Our God is humble. He descends. Okay, so he's... That's he's a dead. weird statement, too, because our God did ascend. He ascended to the right hand of God. So yeah, he did. That's the first thing I thought. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Right. Yeah, actually, he did. <laughs> it's like he's trying to be profound here. And again, he's just selling his whole Jezebel spirit thing. And yeah. in the process of doing that, you know, he's he's really not biblical in anything that he's saying here. Yeah, no, he's no, he's not. And and I don't think a single man in that room, when they saw this guy climb up the pole with a sword in his mouth or whatever, I don't think a single one of them thinking, "Wow, that's a really beautiful picture of of what God did." Who's <laughs> who's who's even thinking that? You know. And then I would also want to know, did anybody there actually think that what they were seeing was anything resembling a stripper performance? Would they have thought that about well, this stunt? That's what I, that's what I was going to about to get to like, okay, we are no apologists for what they did here, but this is a, a men's conference full of Rah rah men stuff. I mean, tanks riding over cars. Yeah, right. You've got very masculine stuff. MMA stuff. You know, boxing, weightlifting. Yep. Football uh, so players come and there, and professional athletes or speakers ball. there. And yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, some you know, yeah, some some masculine stuff here. Macho stuff. That's right. I would wager to bet there is not a single homosexual in that room. 
why, why would they at have least, some? Why, if at least not openly, but yeah, that's at least not open. Yeah, <laughs> that like that would be to have to have a male stripper come in and perform. That would be the like the last thing they would ever want to have come in at a conference like this, right? Right. Yeah, for all the different things that James River Church does with this particular conference, that's not anything that we've seen before um, uh, no. in this conference. It, it's not becoming progressively more homosexual. It's it's uh -huh. more and more macho every year is what they're trying to yeah. do. Yeah, but, but I mean, furthermore, Driscoll has fed into this. He's been involved in this men's conference since 2017. So right. the the more grandiose it gets every single year, he's contributed to that. And you yeah. don't hear any humility in what he's saying here. Like he's, he's not going, listen, guys, I've been a part of this for seven years and we're letting this get out of hand. And I'm sorry that it's gotten this far. There's no humility in this, in this at all. Mm -mm. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. And then he swallowed a sword and Jesus cried. Okay. Pastor John, I'll receive that. Thank you. Okay, so and that's when John Lindell, the pastor, said, called out, you're done, you're done, stop, right. you're done. And um, and then Mark Driscoll walked off. And so so uh, John Lindell now walks up on the platform. Okay, Gabe. So Lindell comes up on the platform and he says that he basically he accused Mark Driscoll of lying. He said that uh, Mark, Mark Driscoll was, was with me for half an hour after the sword swallower guy and before he got up on platform. He was with him for half an hour. He never said one word about right. this thing if he had a problem with it. And, right, and you know, and that's another kind of hint that that Driscoll was doing something opportunistic here. Yeah, why would he not have in that half an hour conversation have said to Lindell, guys, what are we doing here? Like, right. where did you know that when this guy got up there that he was going to look like a stripper or something like that? Um, you know, there was no sort of confrontation. <laughs> Excuse me, no sort of confrontation like that. Now, I'm not one who thinks that this necessarily needed a Matthew 18 sort of exchange where you go to the brother who's offended you, you talk with him. Uh, this Matthew 18, 15, where Jesus gives the mm. uh, the guidelines for church discipline. You talk with your brother alone, and if he repents, well, then you've won your brother. Yeah. But if he doesn't repent, then you bring two or three others along that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he won't listen to them, you take it to the church. And if he won't listen to the church, then you treat him as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, in this particular situation, if it were like a false teacher or something like that would be on the platform, which there have been plenty of those at this particular men's conference. No doubt. Then another teacher coming up and calling that out. I don't think that needs a Matthew 18 approach. Jesus didn't privately confront the Pharisees before he called out the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. But in this particular situation... You you clearly had a situation where they're they're alone together, and Mark doesn't even tell the guy, "I'm going to go up there and I'm going to call this out yeah. or ask any questions to see like how much Lindell knew that this man was going to do when he uh, did this performance or anything like that." It really looks like Driscoll took an opportunity, mm -hmm. and he and he said something that has been part of uh, the preaching that he's been doing for at least the past year. 
this platform issue that he has of a Jezebel spirit. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Very opportunistic. Yeah. If he was so bothered by it, he, he should have said something in the half hour he had before he got up on the platform. This is, this is uh but this is typical Mark Driscoll. He's wanting to, um, wanting to, to make a name for himself, wanting to get his name in the, in the headlines. And we certainly did that, you know, but, um, uh, and I must say, I find it ironic anytime I hear churches like this quote Matthew 18. My first thought is, well, how convenient. You don't even do Matthew 8. You don't even do church discipline at your church. I guarantee you, James River Church has never done church discipline. They always right. stop with verse 15. You know, right. they never go through all the way through verse 20 and uh, get to the point where they get up on a Sunday morning and tell the entire church what, you know, Billy Bob and their congregation has been doing, what his sin is and all that. They never do that. So at any rate, I digress. But, you know, if <laughs> if the Jezebel spirit is there trying to seduce men through a male stripper, um, I think the Jezebel, she came to the wrong conference because I don't, I don't think she's going to have a lot of success. <laughs> yeah, and it is kind of funny, too, that he... <laughs> That, that he throws women under the bus. Like, what does a Jezebel spirit have anything to do with, with any of this? This right. this would be hyper-masculinity would be the problem here, more so than, yeah. than some sort of Jezebel spirit. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, and, and I'm fine with, you know, uh, football and all that kind of stuff. And I, I like to go out and I, li I like to watch football. I like to ride my four-wheeler. I like to shoot my guns. I like to go. I happen to know. I happen to know that there's a video out there of you shooting a flamethrower. So no, we know what kind. We know what kind of guy you are, Justin. You sure that was me? So y'all never seen a crippled guy in a suit and tie shooting a flamethrower at a clown? <laughs> now you have. <laughs> Oh, Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm fine with all that stuff, but that's not, uh, that's not what being a man is about. It's not what being a godly husband is about. So anyway, all right. Well, very typical Mark Driscoll. And um, it, it's also ironic that he would, he would get so exercised about this at least what he perceives to be some sexual immorality when he himself has claimed that the Holy spirit gives him pornographic visions. I'm sure you've seen yes. that, right? Oh yeah. Some people actually see things. Uh, this may be gift of discernment on occasion. I see things. I see things. Uh, there was one woman uh, I dealt with. She'd never told her husband that, uh, she had committed adultery on him early in the relationship. I said, you know, she's sitting there with her husband. I said, you know, I think the root of all this, I think Satan has a foothold in your life because you've never told your husband about that really tall blonde guy that you met at the bar. And then you went back to the hotel and you laid on your back and you undressed yourself and he climbed on top of you and you had sex with him and snuggled up with him for a while. And deep down in your heart, uh, even though you had just met him, you desired him because secretly he is the fantasy body type. I said, you remember that place? It was that cheap hotel with that certain colored bedspread. You, did, you had sex with the light on because you weren't ashamed and you wanted him to see you and you wanted to see him. She's just looking at me like, I said, you know, it was about 10 years ago. I mean, that, and yeah, I, somebody else brought that up last night too and I was seeing people respond to what Driscoll was saying. It's like, apparently Driscoll didn't have a problem with God showing him pornographic images in his head, at least according right. to him, that's his claim, which would be a very, that's blasphemous to say that, that, uh, that God's giving you these images of, of these women doing these sexually immoral things, which mm -hmm. he's lying about that and doesn't seem to have a problem with proclaiming those kinds of things. Uh, doesn't call out his own sins, has never repented of the stuff that he's done. You know, if, if people are, are watching and are not familiar with Driscoll, there's something like there's a letter with something like 30 former elders with Mars Hill Church that that since he's left have said this man was never repentant. He has never apologized for anything that he's done. The That's abuses right. that he did while he was a pastor, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, 
um, manipulating church funds and all this kind of stuff. Driscoll is not a different person. He's just moved on That's to right. his next grift. And and it's sad that our our memories are so short over the stuff that he's done just just 10 years ago. It was 2014 when he left Mars Hill Church. He's yeah. been doing this yeah. men's conference since 2017. Yeah. So he just yeah. moved on to his next thing. And there are people that are uh, cheering for him, completely unaware or at, or at least willing to forget that this man is unqualified. He is not fit to be a pastor That's and right. uh, and is every bit as much of a problem of the stuff that was going on at that men's conference um, as the stuff that he was calling out. He's contributed to all of this. He's not a hero here. That's right. That's right, Gabe. I'm so glad you said that. He is not a hero here. He is unqualified. He is both unqualified and disqualified from being in any kinds of any kind of ministry, the plagiarism, the coarse language, the sexually explicit language. Uh, as you said, there were, I think, almost 40 former elders of Mars Hill signed this statement saying that he is uh, unfit for ministry. So, yeah, man shouldn't be anywhere near a pulpit. All right. Well, well, Gabe, brother, thank you very much for your input here. Uh, appreciate your help. Always a pleasure being on. I thank you for uh, playing uh, that recent video of mine too. Yeah. Uh, just to just to give a plug, <laughs> excuse me, uh, to give a plug for this, you helped me push my YouTube channel WWUTT over fifty thousand subscribers because you played that video. So yeah. I thank you for that. Well, I'm happy to do it, brother. I, I appreciate you know. There's some there's some really bad YouTube channels out there in the evangelical world, but there's some good ones too, and I like to I like to promote the the good ones and point people in uh their direction and yours is one of them wwutt link down below dear friends in the description as well as to to gabe's church out there in in what town again casa grand arizona casa grand arizona where it's 95 degrees right now so if you like <laughs> the heat go pay them a visit all right <laughs> thanks gabe god bless Appreciate you brother it. thank you, you too Okay, now, dear ones, my interview with Travis Allen, who had the first-hand interaction with Mark Driscoll in the publicity stunt that he pulled at Grace Community Church back in 2013, and uh, it's my joy to interview him. This will be very enlightening into the character of Mark Driscoll. Okay, well, Travis, brother, thank you for joining me. How are you today? Hey, I'm well. How are you, Justin? Good to see you. Good to see you too, brother. Good to see you too. Always good to see you. All right. So Travis, you and I have been together on a number of occasions. Uh, the first of which was the Strange Fire Conference back in 2013. Yeah. But um, since then, I've been to I've been to your church. We've hung out. We've spent some time together, and uh, a great deal of love and affection for you and your ministry, your family, and uh, um, you have some personal experience with. Mark Driscoll. And so uh, you've seen the video. I've already played it in the first part of, of this video. So you've seen the video, what happened at this conference. And um, I think this was a publicity stunt. Tell us about your your history with Mark Driscoll and what you've observed firsthand. Right. Um, well, there is precedent for you assuming that this might be a publicity stunt. Um, when you know, back in 2013, um, Mark Driscoll and James McDonald were on their way to a conference um, where they were going to be speaking, and and I like think bringing a bunch of a bunch of like Acts 29 pastors with them and things yeah. like that. So they were down in the Southern California area, and the way he told the story is they just happened to be in town, and hey, why don't we? pop over to the uh to the strange fire conference uh, i think these these guys would uh you know they'd appreciate some free copies of the book that i just wrote i just want to be gracious and hand out some copies and that kind of thing so he showed up on campus and it kind of was causing a little bit of a buzz um and there were um you know some who had the idea of well, let's just be as shrewd as Mark Driscoll and kind of line up a bunch of guys who are kind of in the know and we'll kind of take all his books from him and that way they won't get circulated around the general hot population. So there was this line of guys out in front of the, the Master's Seminary building on the campus of Grace Community Church 
because and, you're not to interrupt, but this is this was the Strange Fire Conference, and and mm-hmm. as you being an elder at the church, you don't, you know, obviously you don't want just anybody coming in and passing yeah. out books that have not been approved by the leadership of the church, right? Yeah. Well, it, it, thanks for thanks for uh, interrupting with that because it's it's important probably to say that I was uh, at that time I was I was working at Grace to You as the managing director. And I was an elder at the church and, and uh, you know, pastor there uh, uh, at one of the fellowship groups there at the church. But my, my, uh, my main work during the week was at Grace to You as the managing director. And, and Grace to You was putting this conference on. It was a Truth Matters conference. Right. And it was uh, but themed for Strange Fire, which was the book that John uh, wrote to expose the of the charismatic movement and to uh, to confront the abuse of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of pneumatology, and to set the record straight on the Holy Spirit. It was a fantastic book, um, you know, yes. parallel with uh, Charismatic Chaos, which has also been a very helpful book. But anyway, so Grace to You is uh, putting on this conference, and I had been tasked with uh, organizing this, bringing it together, and conducting, you know, all the research and stuff for it and, and uh, putting this thing into play. So we'd obviously had a number of people who had come to, um, you know, come to distribute books or set up, you know, vendors or uh, people promoting their ministries and having ministry tables or ministry displays. And all of that is vetted beforehand. And so, you know, you go through a process for that and, um, you know, you're right. approved or not. And so, that had already happened. It's the conference is going on and Mark Driscoll shows up to, you know, essentially to act in a de facto way as a vendor promoting his ministry and handing out his books. So, I, you know, as the organizer of the conference and, and having a role there, I just thought, well, this, this isn't right. And so again, there were, there were guys lined up kind of in the know, taking his books and things like that. And so, uh, I, I just happened to, at the time, be in John's office and talking to some of the guys. And, and uh, I just said, look, John, this is, you know, this is going on. John MacArthur is completely unfazed by this kind of stuff. And he, 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 he could kind of care less one way or another. He's like, you know, God's going to take care of this stuff. And I just said, John, do you mind if I just go and uh, confront this and ask him to uh, stop handing out books and you know, look, look, I'll invite him to the conference. I'll give him a wristband so he can join the conference. I think he could really benefit from uh, the sessions at the strange fire conference and learn a thing yeah, or two. That's for sure. Uh, so John said, yeah, go for it. So went down there, grabbed uh, the head of our security department, Tom Hatter, uh, who's a, he's a good friend and a dear man, uh, you know, long career with the LAPD used to handling all kinds of issues. And so just a very competent uh, man to have by your side. I went to, went to Mark and I said, hey, listen, you know, I just kind of introduced myself, introduced Tom and just said, look, Mark. Mark, I want to introduce you to our head of our security. Tom Hatter, Tom Hatter. nice to meet you. Uh, you know, we've had people who have, <clears throat> who've actually formally applied to be vendors here. Uh, you never applied, you're not on that list. And really you appro- handing out books at this conference is really an inappropriate thing. Could you please not do that? And in fact, I'd love to give you a wristband, have you join uh, free of charge on us. And uh, he said, oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. He was, he was cordial. He stopped handing out the books um, and uh, you know, just had them behind him, but kept greeting people. So I just backed off and let that let that continue and um, um, watched him for a bit. And I noticed that he was talking with guys and he'd shake their hand. They'd go right around him and go grab one of the books out of the box. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe it's maybe it's an anomaly. No, man number two, man number three, over and over it goes on down the line. They're, they're talking to him for a couple minutes, shake his hand, go around grab a book. So he's essentially telling him, Hey, just go grab a book. He's doing the same thing. He's just not putting a book into their hand. He's having them go grab it. So I just went up to him and I said, listen, Mark, whether you're handing the books to the guy yourself or you're having him go get it, it's the same thing. I've asked you, please, could you not hand out the books? 
And I don't remember if it was in that first exchange or this second exchange where he said, what are you going to do if I don't? You know, what are you going to do if I, if I keep handing them out? And I just, I, I thought to myself, what are we like in junior high? I, this, right. this is strange that you would kind of front up to me like that. And so I just said to him, yeah. Mark, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I was like, I, <laughs> I didn't anticipate really that he would say something like that, but just that he'd be polite and do what I do what we ask, you know, right. it's not his, right. this isn't his church. It's not his conference. And I thought, nope. well, that would be the, that just kind of be what a, what a man does is just say, oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry for the offense. And that's, uh, what, that's but, what a man does. And he had just come from a conference titled act like men. The, that, that was the irony of it. Yeah. The, the conference that he and James McDonald were, were heading down to was, uh, was the act like men conference. Right? And James McDonald was there with him too, correct? He was. Yeah. He was kind of wearing like a, like a do rag or something. And, and they, they, they were driving like a, I don't know if it was a Mustang or a Camaro or something, but it was kind of parked out back of the the seminary building. And, uh, you know, there were people kind of chatting those guys up, getting some pictures and selfies, and I don't know what they were doing. Anyway, so I just said, look, you know, could you please not do this? He's like, what are you going to do if I don't? I said, I don't, I don't know. I haven't really, I'll think that through when I have to, but could you please not do it? And so... Yeah. He, um, I think Tom had also talked to him and said a couple things, introduced himself. And so he said, look, um, I'll give you the books. And we said, yeah, Mark, we don't, thank you. We don't want your books. He said, no, I'm giving you, it's a gift to you. So now just let us, Tom will grab them. We'll just put, go put them back in the Mustang or, you know, whatever your car is, uh, take them back behind the building, put them in your car. And he said, he said, no. I mean, it. I really, I just want to give these to you as a gift. It's my gift to you. Just go ahead and take them. So we said, okay, all right. Didn't, uh, you know, want to spurn his, his kindness. So whether you're putting them in people's hands or whether people are going to get them from the box, same thing. So he's going to take the books. So James McDonald's over there waiting for you. Just put them in the Mustang. He'll take them. Why don't you guys just take them to whoever you want? Well, we're going to put them back in the Mustang. Yeah, we want to give them back to you. Please, that's fine. Okay. I'd like to give them as a gift. So we we took the books and Tom took them into the into the um, the church offices. It uh, sometime sometime during this, um, and I I can't remember if it was right before or right after. Someone told me, yeah, Mark Driscoll actually. It, it turns out he contact before he got on campus, he contacted his publicist and told the publicist, hey, you want to send some reporters over here because we're about to stir things up over the Strange Fire Conference. It was a publicity stunt from the very beginning to promote himself, his ministry, his books. And so anyway, and that has actually been um, verified through some of his former elders who have also spoken of this. And, and to their credit, they've spoken of it with a kind of a contrite um you know, remorse that they were even involved in this little stunt to begin with. And they've described, um, you know, from their perspective, what's going on or what, what happened that day. Yeah. So all that, all that happens later on, we find out he posted on uh, Twitter. I think it was security just confiscated my books. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> really? That's how he spun this. So once again, it was another, it was just one attempt to stir up trouble and cause, uh, cause a scene and try to, I, I think he was maybe trying to embarrass us if we had a bad reaction uh -huh. uh, and, and then trying to, when it, when that didn't happen, try to find another way to kind of needle us a bit. And, but whatever, whatever was in, in the recesses of his heart, God knows. I, I think that from beginning to end and all the way through the end of it, it was a publicity stunt. And I believe that um, it was Janet Mefford that really started to expose him. And mm -hmm. she kind of, you know, really, really bulldogged that as she got onto, got him onto her uh, program yeah. and uh, started to really dissect his, 
I frankly childish behavior yeah. and um, expose this to um, yeah. expose this to her audience. And that was kind of the kind of the beginning of his downfall as he there were some plagiarism charges and there was the, the stunted strange fire. There was, you know, all his abusive stuff coming out as well. And now we have, you know, he's as, as you were just telling me, he started going to this current conference where he's done something that looks eerily similar, <laughs> uh, mm. reminiscent of that first publicity stunt. Yep. But uh, he's been going to that conference since 2017. Uh, three years after he yep. was kind of deposed from his church and then went and set up shop down in the Phoenix area with Trinity church. And yep. now he's, now he's in another church and another con. It's like he, he, the guy, the guy is an abusive, bad example, um, charismatic chaos, all the kinds of issues, anti Calvinist, uh, angry, all that stuff, prideful. Yep. And they're going to put him back up on a stage again right. and, and present him to men, a whole bunch of men there. We're right. trying to learn about biblical manhood in a time in a time when we really do need biblical manhood. We do need a return to a clarity on the on the roles of men and women. Yeah, uh, to portray that as manhood to right. put him before people. That just it just grieves my heart to see that. Yeah, indeed, indeed, Travis, that is unbelievable. You know, to to set this up, to plan it out, to 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 contact reporters. Hey, I'm gonna. And tell him I'm gonna I'm gonna stir it up at the Strange Fire Conference, and then to and then to just flat out lie right. about you saying that his books were confiscated. Yeah, that's I mean that's a bald faced lie. It is it is a bald faced lie. I was uh, you know, and again uh, to 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 take someone like that and put him up before men. Yeah. And, and, and then, uh, you know, again, the whole premise of the, I, I think of your program is you're talking about that stronger men conference yeah. and it's got, it's got bull riding and tanks, destroying vehicles and monster truck and motorcycle jumping. And it's like evil Knievel mixed with church. Yeah. And you got, you got, you know, Mark's taking issue, calling a Jezebel, calling out about a Je calling out a Jezebel spirit because there's a sword swallower that's ripped his shirt off and climbed a pole with a sword in his mouth. And I'm wondering what is more unfitting in that setting, the yeah. sword swallower or Mark Driscoll. I can tell you what's unfitting is the name of Jesus Christ is unfitting in a place like that. Yeah. I mean, do all that stuff have NFL quarterbacks come in and all, you know, to try to legitimize what you're doing. Yeah. But don't mix the name of Jesus Christ there. I, I would prefer to, I mean, sword swallowers, if they want to go make a buck swallowing swords, uh, more power to them. If you want to, you know, if you're, if you're really good at jumping motorcycles or <laughs> driving tanks over cars, whatever your thing is right. fine. And that's uh that's entertainment. And you want to entertain people and have a weekend to do that. I get no yeah. problem. But when you start to mix the name of Christ and try to start to speak words about gospel and try to call this preaching, you're, you're now blending um, entertainment, pop culture stuff, uh, caricatures of manhood and male things into what is calling that Christian and saying that that is the model of manhood. Yeah. I think there are a lot of men who are being led astray by that. And I just would like to see men be men and look at yeah. Jesus Christ in the scripture, not what's portrayed here, not definitely not what's portrayed by Mark Driscoll and his ilk. Yeah. But look at Jesus Christ and see what he is. I was just, you and I had inter interacted in this and my, my Bible reading happened to take me through the book of Ruth this morning. Mm -hmm. and I'm looking at Boaz. This mm -hmm. man is, this man is a behind the scenes, um, you know, he, he only comes to the forefront because of the story of Ruth. Yep. But yep. the man is behind the scenes. He's a fair, righteous man. He's He cares about his uh, the people who are gleaning his fields. He cares about this widow. Young widow comes in. Yeah. He wants to take care of her. He serves her. He's kind to her. You know, you don't see this abusive, self-promoting, chest-beating, chest-thumping kind of a uh, a macho man. You see a guy who's very gentle, and when he said when he gives his word, he acts on it immediately. He goes to 
to conduct, you know, take the place of the kinsman redeemer to put his yeah. his his covering over this woman and care for her, yes. to raise up children for her dead husband. I mean, a guy is totally self-sacrificial, giving himself to the law and giving himself to kindness and the compassion of God. That's manhood. That's Boaz. You don't Amen. see that. You don't see that guy making the conference stage in a place no. like, you know, Stronger Men Conference. That's right. That's right. Amen. Well said, Travis. Well said. That's why I wanted to interview you on my program, brother, right there. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for having me, Justin. I appreciate so much what you do and in, in calling attention to some of these, some of these shenanigans. I, you know, I, you and I were kind of chatting offline about this, about how it's it's so disappointing to see, you know, you you saw, it, I think Christianity Today called it the the rise and fall of the modern uh, uh, or the rise and fall of uh, Mars Hill. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and you know, did that whole series talking about the fall of Mark Driscoll and Mars Hill and what uh, everything that came apart. I think that they they because they weren't equipped theologically, they didn't really get to the heart of the theological issues and the ecclesiological issues, yeah. uh, pastoral issues in that in that right. series. But they right. did a good job exposing some of those things. You would think that that guy could never find his place into a pulpit again. And yet they're just, I guess it's just a big world out there. And there are so many people who don't know or don't care, but they don't know. And then they find themselves right back at conferences like this, where a guy like that is headlined. It's so disappointing to see that. So I'm grateful for what you do, Justin. Sometimes I wonder like, how is it that you can continue on? You've, you've done such a thorough exposure of the, the, the charismatic chaos and some of the the loony fringe stuff that really is mainstream in the charismatic movement, but you do such a good job exposing it. And I think they can't have a leg, leg to stand on. I think you said it during COVID too. You said, you said, if they're not walking through the land, healing everybody of COVID and yeah. running the pandemic off of the earth. Right. Um, and, you know, then they're, they're kind of exposed just by this pandemic thing. Yeah, but they're back. <laughs> They've come back, <laughs> and yep. uh, and they're they seem to be stronger than ever. So yeah, I appreciate what you do, uh, Justin, for the kingdom. Thanks, Travis. That that means a lot to me, brother. Especially coming from you. Thank you. Thank you. I've, you've heard me say this before, and I'll I'll say it to to you, dear friends. I you know I'm an evangelist, and I, I travel and preach and teach, um, um, and it's my joy to do so. But I tell you, I have a tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for all of our love and respect for all of our faithful shepherds out there, pastors, elders out there that are serving in local churches that aren't known, aren't aren't being asked to speak at the big conferences, but they are out there doing the Lord's work, rightly dividing the word of truth, shepherding the flock, loving the flock, uh, doing all these things. It's it's uh, and Travis, you're one of them, brother, and and uh, it's guys like you that one day will be at the front of the line. So I appreciate you, brother. Oh, man. I don't know about that front of the line thing, but I sure appreciate the the kudos to the pastors because yeah. I it is such a joy and a, a, an honor to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in, in that capacity to follow, to be able to do what Jesus says in scripture and try to be one of the under shepherds that represent his shepherding interest as a good shepherd over the church uh, to care for yeah. his flock is just a, a great privilege, as you know. Amen. Amen. Indeed, brother. Thank you so much, Travis. You're sure welcome. Thanks for having me on, Justin. You bet. You bet. And you are at Grace Church Greeley, Colorado. And that's right. GraceGreeley.org. GraceGreeley.org. Like All like right. Well, it, up, give us a listen. Yeah. Good deal. GraceGreeley.org. Right. So you're uh, an an hour or so northeast of Denver. Yeah, just just north of Denver. I mean, it's it, it's almost a direct line up. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, just go up yeah, by 25, true. about 45 minutes an hour or so. We're we're just off to the right a little bit. Depending on traffic. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I love to point people to good solid churches. And so uh, maybe some folks watching this will will discover you guys and 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 give you a, a visit. Come yeah. Watch. Well, thank thank you, Justin. We'll have to have you back sometime soon because you're well loved around here. So appreciate you. I would love it. Kathy and I both would. All, All right, right, man. <laughs> but she won't be preaching, just me. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> thanks travis see you man bye 
I hope that this has been helpful for you, dear ones. Thank you very much for joining me, for watching the program. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all. Tom Hatter, nice to meet you. Whether you're putting him in different stands or whether people are going to get them in the box, same thing. So he's going to take the books. So James McDonald's over there waiting for just put them in the Mustang. He'll take them. Why don't you guys just take them to whoever you want? We're going to put them back in the Mustang. Yeah, we want to give them back to you. That's fine. Okay. I'd like to give them as a gift. Well, yeah, yeah, just take it as a gift.